Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So good to be here this morning. There's so much, so much happening. <laughs> um, I just want to share a few things with you um, that are happening. So first, firstly, so next Sunday, we have a special guest who's going to be teaching. He's a friend of this house. How many of you know Bruce Belair, Brother Bruce Belair. <laughs> Brother Bruce um, was the youth pastor at the uh, church in Halifax, um, Rock Church, thank you, uh, in Halifax, and uh, just so full of vivacious, like he's just vivacious and full of life. And so he's going to be speaking at the men's breakfast on Saturday. And just a reminder that the men's breakfast is going to be held at the Linkletter Community Center. I think that's what Darren told me. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> Link letter. It was in a few different, so it's at Link Letter, just to confirm, Link Letter, 8 o'clock. He'll be speaking, um, and I believe just to help cover costs, we're asking for $10. Is that right, Darren? Ten, bring $10 with you. Um, just help cover those costs. And then uh, Sunday morning, Bruce will be here to share a message with you. Um, and uh, myself and Colby and Heather and 15, well, a bunch of us are going to uh, Jesus, Jesus 24. There's 16 of us going uh, to Jesus 24 in California. Um, it's a conference there led by the Jesus Image um, Church out of Florida. Uh, but God is doing some amazing things in California. I don't know if you have seen <laughs> on the social media, but um, who, have see, who has seen the Jesus Revolution movie? So that's happening again in California. There are thousands at beaches being baptized. The Lord is moving in California. It is phenomenal what he's doing there. And so we just are excited to be going. It was interesting when I was asking the Lord, Lord, am I to go to this conference? I remember sitting with the Lord saying, so Jesus, um, should, I go to this Jesus, should I go to the Jesus conference? And then I was like, um, yeah, the Jesus conference. <laughs> anyway, I just kind of felt him smile. Uh, and I just felt him say in my spirit that I want you to go because I want you to see what I'm doing in the earth. I want you to see what's going on and where I'm moving. And I really do believe that when we go into and get a chance to see where, where God is moving, that we get to pick up and cross-pollinate, pick up those things, and bring them back and deposit them here. And so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we're excited uh, to go, to receive, and to bring back what the Lord is doing in California. And so we look forward to that. Um, and yeah, pray for us. Yes, thank you, Colby. Yes, there are four generations going, which excites us. So we've got young adults up to our older folks. <laughs> so the generations are going, because remember what, what, what uh, Peter, when he repeated the prophecy from Joel, that I will pour out my spirit in these last days on the young and the old, right? Your young men, your young women, young and old. And so um, it's important that we recognize when God moves, he moves through and with all of us. No one is left out in God's kingdom. We all, got to, we all get to experience this together. So I'm very excited about what's taking place. And so also next weekend uh, here in the building, um, the building is being rented by the Baptist churches and they're having a big youth rally here uh, Friday and Saturday overnight. And so there's going to be 200 youth uh, in this building and they're going to be serving the community. And so what I love about this building is we get to be part of the community in a variety of ways. Um, and so we get to see the youth blessed to use this building and go out um, uh, and do some good work um, this weekend as well. So God is doing some very cool things. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Awesome. All right. Well, let's let's dig in. Um, what am I talking about today? <laughs> Jesus. Oh, hello, Andrew. Yes, we have to borrow a mic. <laughs> I am so pumped. <laughs> like Shirley just turned to me and she said, don't you wish you could be going? Oh. 
And yeah. <laughs> when I found out how many people were going and what was going on, I just thought, oh, man, I can't go because Brother Bruce is staying with me. <laughs> I can't abandon him. <laughs> but how many of you are pumped that 16 of our church can go to California? Woo. <laughs> and how many of you wish that you could be on a private plane <laughs> and we could all go together? All right, yeah. Yeah, well, okay, if that's in your heart right now, stand up. Yeah, just if you'd love to be going to get your heart filled and to get rejuvenated. <laughs> and if you want more of the Lord, hmm. if you're hungry for more of the Lord, just stand up. Mm. And if that's not you, but you really want the 16 who are going to be filled up and you're still sitting down, could you please stand up and join <laughs> with us? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, Father. Mm, thank you, God. Do what you do best. Mm. And fill us up yeah. where we have a need. Yeah. Whether we go to California or whether we stay home, mm -hmm. you love to meet our needs. That's right. And we all have needs right now. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us have needs. Mm -hmm. So many of us have people that aren't in the kingdom and we love them and we yeah. want to see them in the kingdom. Yeah. And Lord, we ask for a refreshment that would come to our church family Mm -hmm. When these 16 people come back. Yeah. And Lord, we, we know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know that there is a shift happening across the earth right now. Yes. And we've, we've heard so many stories. I heard it again this week of so many Muslims who are having dreams in Turkey right now. Mm -hmm. and, and they are hungry for Jesus because of what they're seeing and hearing in yeah. their dreams. Yes. And we are so thankful, Lord, mm. that some of our family can go and see and touch and taste and see what you are doing yeah. in California mm -hmm. and what you're going to do in Prince Edward Island. Yes. That this is not just for one little spot in the world, that this no. is for the whole world. And you are Amen. preparing our world for your return. Yes. And so we... Mm -hmm. Just put your hand over your heart right now. And we say, would you anoint our sister Tracy with the words that she has prepared and words that she hasn't prepared mm -hmm. and open our hearts to receive what you have for us to receive. Yeah. We thank you and bless you mm. in Jesus name. Jesus Amen. name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Well, it has been quite a week, and I first just want to thank you all for your love and for your support for Ron and I as we said goodbye to his mom, my mother-in-law, Mary Linkletter, this past week. Our lives are forever changed at the loss of a parent. Many of you have walked this journey before us, and many of you have yet to walk this journey and I know that grieving is a process and it's unique to each person. And so I'd also like to express my condolences to Audrey G. Arsenault and her husband Jason, Jason who's here, her daughters, Clara and Renee, uh, who also said goodbye to Audrey's mom, to Lisa G. on Friday. And I know, I, I know we have visitors here. We have Uncle Roy and Aunt Cicela. So welcome. So glad that you guys could join us this morning. Um, it was a beautiful celebration of Audrey's mom, and they're walking through grief and the loss of a mom and a grandmother. And I recognize that the loss of a parent, that at the loss of a parent, there is now one prominent figure that's no longer in our lives. Someone significant has been removed from, from my story, from my husband's story, from Audrey and Jason and the girl's story. And from that, we're forever impacted by them, but they're no longer present. 
and our life story takes a shift. It changes. It will look, feel, and be different without them. And we feel sadness. We feel the loss. And yet, in Jesus, we know that it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. And one day, we'll we'll all take that same journey and learn more about where the story goes after we leave this earth. At death, our story is not over. And I've been really reminded of that this week. And I thank Jesus that he holds the keys of death and that in him, death gets to now make a way to new life, an eternal life with him. And it's this amazing mystery that I'm so curious about. And I know that one day my curiosity will be satisfied. We will know, we will understand what it actually looks like what it actually means. And so again, just thank you um, for just your love and your care uh, for both my family and for the Arsenault and G family as well. So today we're going to start a new teaching series on Romans 8. And I'm just going to like barely touch in into Romans. Um, But previously we were in a six-week series on experiencing the Holy Spirit, and the goal was to learn more about this important person of the Godhead and to grow in our openness to experience him as part of the fullness of God. And so I just want to just want to thank Josh Hoffert, Colby Lidstone, Heather Shea for helping teach us more about the Holy Spirit. And you know what? I feel like we've just scratched the surface. <laughs> There is so much to know about the Holy Spirit, and there's always going to be more to learn. God is so beautiful, and there's always going to be more to experience of his beauty and his goodness and his kindness. And the fact that there's always going to be more for us to discover makes me so excited. There's always going to be so much more. And did you know, did you know that even the greatest scholars— are constantly finding out new things about God, about his nature, and the story that he is weaving amongst us. Like these scholars have dedicated their very lives to the study of scripture, and they're always grasping something new. And it's interesting because um, um, I'm going to get his name mixed up now because I keep thinking of R.T. Kendall, but I'm actually thinking of N.T. Wright. Um, N.T. Wright, who's been a scholar for, I think it's like 40 years, and he's a huge, he studies the Paul's letters. He's a huge knowledge on Paul's letters. And uh, he just wrote a book on Romans 8 because of his work with students and study. He's like, I have discovered things that I didn't even recognize years ago. And this is a man who spends his time studying scripture, and there's this newness that he's discovered. And so, in knowing that, I just want to encourage us, like your learning never stops. You never have it all figured out. There comes points in your life where you recognize what you learned actually wasn't correct or wasn't the full picture, and we have to let go of those things and embrace the new things that he is showing us as we dig into scripture. So it's so important that we're constantly learning and open to what he wants to show us. And um, like no one has it finalized and neatly figured out. No one. (laughs) No human on this earth. Uh, Thus, we must all be willing to discover those new things. And I just, I love that God calls us his kids, right? We're called his children. We are his children. And scripture reminds us that We only see in part, and we only know in part, right? Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 13. And so my prayer is that we'd be willing to choose to come and sit at his feet and to constantly learn from him, constantly learn from him. The opportunities to grow and fall more in love with Jesus and the life he offers us is never-ending, never-ending. Isn't that (laughs) it's so good. It's so good. So how many of you love stories, whether it's a book or a movie or a short story told by a friend? Who loves stories? Yes. (laughs) Stories have a way of drawing us in to them. And as a child, I was a ferocious reader I loved stories. I even wrote some of my own little short stories with my own illustrations. 
And my mom started me young with the little golden books. Who remembers the little golden books? Yes. <laughs> and I loved them so much that I would tear the pages out of the books, uh, much to my mother's chagrin. But I suspect I just wanted to be like in those pages. I wanted to be in the story. I wanted to create my own story with those characters. And I just loved how the stories unfolded and all the things you get to experience in a story. Now, why do we love stories so much? Like most of you put up your hands. Why do we love stories so much? Now, I do find it fascinating that through more uh, recent scientific research on the brain, so we're getting more information about how the brain works, um, we now know what Jesus knew all along, that storytelling is a natural and powerful way to communicate right to our brains. And for thousands of years, humans have relied on story and stories can help us share our knowledge, our experiences, our emotions, um, as well as we can learn from others as we hear them tell, tell their stories. Stories also inspire us to take action, to change our perspective, to change our assumptions. And when you read the Gospels, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which chronicle Jesus' life, we see that Jesus' primary mode of communication was story. And what do we call them in Scripture? parables. So there are these short stories called parables. And one can say that God is in the process of writing a grand story that we get to be part of. We are part of a much larger narrative, and we have a part to play. And the author, who is God, knows what your part looks like. He knew before you even were born, before the foundations of the earth, he knew that you would be here, and he knew what your story was going to look like. Now, Donald Miller, some of you may be familiar with that name, um, has a really good book on the power of story called Hero on a Mission, and he shares that a good story has four main roles. So there's the victim, the one that believes they are doomed. I'm doomed. I, can't, I just can't do this. There's the villain, who's the one that makes others small. The hero, the one who accepts the challenge and transforms, and we all love the hero and the guide, the one who helps the hero. Now, stories have a dilemma. There's a struggle, or what we call the plot. And what is interesting is that our brains focus on characters and their mental states. So when telling a story, the brain attends more to what the character is thinking or feeling during an event than the sequence of events itself. So though the plot may be enticing, we are more interested in what the characters are going to do. We are asking, how are they going to deal with what they're facing? What's motivating them? What choices are they going to make? How is this going to turn out? And we might find ourselves thinking, well, what would I do in that situation? And what can I learn? So in the reality of our lives, at any given moment, we have a choice in the story of our lives. What role am I going to play? Every day, we could be any of those roles. We could be the villain, the victim, the hero, or the guide. And the gift of free will that God has given us means that we always have that choice. Whether we feel like we're free to choose it or not, we have a choice. We can choose. And we might not like the consequences of the choice. So we might get stuck in a role like victim or villain. And I want to be clear, at any given time, you have been all of those roles. All of us have. It can be hard to admit that you've been a villain or a victim, but we've all been there. And we've all made those choices. So have you ever read a book or gotten halfway through a movie and you're thinking, oh, this is not good. This is like, this is not going to end well. There is no hope. There is no way that this is going to turn around. A few weeks ago, I talked about Jesus' disciples. And when you're only halfway through the story, it can look like things are bound to fail and, or they're going to fail badly. In those moments, for me, the hopelessness often feels so real. I can really get engaged in a story and I can feel like, oh, this is really bad. Um, and it's almost palatable to me and I can actually sometimes literally taste it or feel it in my whole body. And to give you an example, 
of how a story can just pull you in and allow you to feel all those emotions. I watched Jurassic Park for the first time back in 1993. I cannot believe this movie is like 30 some years old. <laughs> so back in 1993, I was just married. Um, and we had spent the summer here, and so we were visiting, and we actually were working in the Church of Christ then, and Andrew was the pastor there, and Ron and I were the summer interns. <laughs> and so in 1993, so midway through this movie, so Ron and I are sitting together, um, and the dinosaurs are loose on the island. They're trying to take over the island. They're chasing all the humans, and I was holding Ron's hand, and without even knowing it, I was literally crushing it. And I was holding it so tight that my fingernails were digging into his skin, threatening to break it. And at one point, Ron gently leans over and says, Tracy, the dinosaurs are not in the theater. You are crushing my hand. I was like, oh. Breathe a sigh of relief. I let go of his hand. I had completely ended the story, and I did not see a way out. I had, I had, um, you know, I believed in Dr. Grant, the paleontologist, uh, the main hero. But how was he ever going to save the children? And <laughs> since the movie is 30 years old, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to just tell you what happens. <laughs> the hero saves the children, um, and the villains get eaten by dinosaurs. Justice is served. <laughs> so it turns out okay. But who knows whatever happened to those dinosaurs on the island? Cliffhanger. <laughs> so anyways, when we are halfway through the story, we can so easily think that that's it. We're done. There's no hope. It's too much. How will I ever get through this? How can this ever turn out well? How many can relate to that feeling? Absolutely, absolutely. So let's take a look at Jesus' life on earth for a moment. So we have the disciples, the 12 disciples who were with Jesus for three years, and they, they had this revelation, they had this clarity that he is the Messiah. They knew that he was the Messiah. And then partway through the story, 70 of Jesus' other followers walk away because Jesus says, if you don't eat my flesh or drink my blood, you will not have eternal life. And they were just out. They're like, nope. The 12, though, on the other hand, they're willing to stay. And they said, Lord, to whom else would we go? You have the very words of life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So they stayed despite everyone else leaving. And in that moment, it probably didn't feel very good to them either. In a similar situation, after the disciples declared Jesus as Messiah, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man is going to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he was going to be killed and after three days rise again. And then in the book of Mark, he writes this. And so Jesus, he spoke plainly, it says about this, and Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus is basically saying, Peter, we are in the middle of the story. <laughs> what you want, your flesh, your will, is not for the best. My death doesn't mean that you're all going to be doomed. That's, I'm sure, what Peter was thinking. <laughs> It will mean you will be free. But the disciples, they could not see that far ahead. They did not understand. And in the middle of our stories, it can feel the same way to us. We do not understand the bigger things that are going on. So the whole idea of Jesus dying was not safe for the disciples. Peter, I mean, he literally took the role of the villain. In that moment, he was wanting the best for himself. He was not considering God's bigger best. He assumed he knew how the story should go. I mean, we all go there thinking, okay, God, I'm going to help you with this. I'm going to figure this out for you. But he didn't know. Only God knows the end of the story. We don't. Only he knows. And I was reminded this week of there's a time to be born, right? And there's a time to die. And, it, you know, in Ecclesiastes, it goes through all the times. He knows exactly what our times are. So then... 
Then, of course, Jesus dies on the cross, as he said he was going to do. And it was the most brutal death at the hands of the Romans. Like how Colby said earlier, this is not a childhood storybook picture. It's a brutal death that Jesus dies. And no one stops it, not even God himself. So it was this huge, devastating blow. How could this ever, ever be okay? The Messiah is dead. And like, and, and like any of us would feel, the disciples were scared. Is this going to happen to us too? So they go to the upper room. They lock themselves in. Scripture is very clear. They lock the door. <laughs> They're hiding away from the Romans and from the religious leaders. And they are victims. They are playing the victim role. They believed that they were doomed. The religious leaders in Rome was going to now take after them. Jesus knows that they are only in the middle of the story, and he is going to make them into heroes. And as we've been talking through Pentecost in the previous weeks, we know that Jesus rises from the dead. He is resurrected, and just like he said, in three days. And he helps the disciples accept the challenge and transform. And we especially see this in Peter who Jesus redeems and affirms and calls to feed his sheep. Peter is the first one to preach the gospel on Pentecost Sunday after the Holy Spirit comes upon them and empowers them. Peter goes from villain, victim, <laughs> to hero. And eventually he becomes a guide. So Jesus suffered and he experienced great pain, loss, loss and rejection. Jesus healed and he performed amazing miracles and works of God. We read that through all of the Gospels. And he suffered and he experienced great pain and loss and rejection. So if Jesus had both of those things, the one that took on flesh, both are part of our life as followers of Jesus. And we must pay attention and be alert and listen. What is God doing in the midst of it all? What is he up to? So healings and signs and wonders, they let us know that God is on the scene, that the kingdom is breaking forth before us. These are necessary, and they point us to salvation. They point us to the God who's putting things right, and he's making things new. They don't save us. I can get healed and not be saved. Though my healing can point me to the person of salvation, Jesus. Pain, on the other hand, wakes me up to my greatest need for God, as does loss and rejection. And one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis that has really just lived in my heart for a long time, constantly pointing me towards God in my pain is that God's megaphone, like pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. When we are in pain, God insists on being attended to as he shouts to us. We can't ignore him because it hurts, and it hurts badly. And when we're hurting, we turn to him. I don't know how many stories I've heard over and over of people saying when they're in pain, yes, pray for me, help me, God, and they turn to him. C.S. Lewis goes on to say in his book, The Problem of Pain, if you want to dig in deeper, it's a great book. He says, the human spirit will not even begin to try to surrender self-will as long as it seems to be well with it. Now, error and sin both have this property that the deeper they are, the less their victim suspects their existence. They are masked evil. Pain, though, is unmasked, unmistakable evil. Every man knows something is wrong when he is being hurt. And pain is not only immediately recognizable evil, but evil impossible to ignore. We can rest contentedly in our sins and our stupidities, and anyone who has watched gluttons shoveling down the most exquisite, exquisite foods as if they don't know what they are eating will admit that we can even ignore pleasure. But pain insists upon being attended to. 
Suffering and pain opens us up to God and life like nothing else can. And we can be too quick to jump to a happy ending. And we can not do such a great job at waiting with the questions. It can feel easier to avoid, to minimize, to try to solve. But that's the victim role. When instead, we can, choose, we can choose the hero role and we can choose to be present. We can choose to hold the sorrow before the Lord and wait for him to come in and do what he wants to do in that sorrow and in that suffering. If there was a purpose in Jesus' suffering, there must be a purpose in ours. Because he went ahead of us. He made a way. So will you choose to be present and hold your pain and simply wait for the Lord to speak and show up? So in Romans 8, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time here, right in the middle of the whole chapter, if there was a heading, it could read, Life in the Spirit makes us able to understand and endure suffering. Because remember, he went before us and he left us with an advocate. He left us with the Holy Spirit to show us how to walk the road he has before us, how to drink the cup that we've been given. So let's take a look. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And when I read this, this is what I heard. I heard, we are his. He says it twice. We are his children. We will share in the suffering and in the glory. Suffering will not be worth comparing to that glory that will be revealed in us. He is saying, you are mine You belong. You are loved with an everlasting love. There is suffering and there is glory. You are mine. You belong. You are loved with an everlasting love. There is suffering. There is glory. So the Holy Spirit reveals to us that we are God's children. We are going to experience suffering and glory like Jesus. And because he has gone before us, he helps us. He wants to be right he wants to be right in the middle of it with you. Will you let him? Will you surrender to what he wants to show you in the middle of that? So we're going to suffer. Whether that's the result of others' choices, our own choices, just the reality of a life in a fallen world or even death, we are going to know pain. God has not taken that away, and it's part of that transformative hero experience. And it is not the end of the story. We are in the middle of our stories. We are in the middle, and there's this encouragement to keep going because there is so much more beyond it. And Paul writes this in Romans 5. Earlier in the book, he says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through his Holy Spirit who he has given us. So will we allow God to be present to us in our suffering? Will we allow him to redeem it? for his purposes and goodness towards us. He wants to redeem it and do more with it than you can even understand. Often as Christians, we like to blame the enemy and his influence, and he is definitely at work, and he is behind the evil. Scripture tells us to beware of the tactics of the enemy, but where must we keep our eyes? On him, right? On Jesus, the author and the protector of our faith. The enemy wants to distract us and have us put our eyes on him when Jesus is like, no, 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 (laughs) up here, up here. Keep our eyes on him. 
So when I think about this, I'm reminded of what Joseph, in the book of Genesis, uh, what he said to his brothers after they were reunited in Egypt, uh, after many years, uh, you know, Joseph had been sold into slavery, uh, and he had quite the life in Egypt before he was raised to a high position of influence in the government there to save people during the seven-year famine. So Joseph is reunited with his brothers. They discover who he is, and Joseph says to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of lives. So just listen to that for a second. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And when I read that, I was like, who does that sound like? Jesus, right? It reminds me of Jesus speaking to his disciples. Don't be afraid. What men did to harm me actually brought about the salvation of the world. The salvation of you and I happened through suffering and harm and pain. After Jesus' resurrection, before his ascension, he is constantly reassuring his disciples. He's meeting with them. He's reassuring them. He's speaking kindly to them. He's reminding them to not be afraid. Don't be afraid. There was more going on than what they could understand in that moment. But he, the Holy Spirit, parakletos, which means he came alongside. He comes alongside of us. And have you ever found yourself saying, God, I need you right now. What good are you going to bring out of this situation? What are you going to do in this? I don't get it. I don't understand. Help me to trust you. Lord, help me have faith that you're going to do something good out of all of this. So I'm focusing on this topic of suffering and hardship as this seems to be a common shared experience amongst many of us right now. It has been a topic of prayer at the elders meeting this past week. It's been a topic of prayer at Thursday morning's prayer and worship. If life feels particularly difficult right now, you are not alone. This sense of it being difficult could be for a variety of reasons. It could be one thing, it could be many things compounding, and it might feel like you're walking through mud. It might feel like it's been overwhelming at times. It's a struggle to go forward because it feels heavy, and it seems heavy, and it feels like too much. Can any of you relate to that? The overarching, the overarching sense I want to share with you today is that God is present in the struggle you are facing. And I want to encourage you to allow it to catapult you to him. Allow it to move you to him. May it draw you to him and not away from him. Instead of being afraid, instead of turning away, instead of hiding, instead of avoiding Allow God to show himself to you in the middle of it because he is there. Whether you recognize him or not, he is there. He's just waiting for you to turn to him and be aware of his presence with you. We're actually getting to practice Psalm 23. Remember where we started this year. Jesus, the good shepherd, has gone ahead. He always goes ahead. Remember, that's what a good shepherd does. He goes ahead, he prepares the pastures, he prepares the journey, and he knows the struggles, he knows the danger, and he knows the pain that you are facing. And he's so close, and it's just you and him as you travel through the valley. His rod, which is the word of the Lord, and his staff, which is the Holy Spirit, will comfort you. He prepares the table before you in the presence of your enemies. He anoints your head with oil, and your cup is overflowing. You have nothing to fear, even though you walk through the deepest, darkest valley. He is with you. It's real, folks. 
it's real. And this life is real. The pain you're going through is real. The struggle, the suffering is real. But he is with you, and he wants you to know that intimately, and he wants to reveal that to you today in such a real way. And if I was to try and describe my own experience, I would say it feels like being stretched like an elastic band, and I'm not sure if I can handle much more, yet I sense deep inside of me that there's a purpose. The stretching, though tiring, challenging, and uncomfortable is teaching me things that somewhere inside of me it's saying it's going to be useful, it's going to be helpful to you in the future. There is purpose in the stretching, the sheer uncomfortableness, and at times the pain of it. I just can't see how it all is going to turn out. I can't see why. And so I look to him and I ask him, what do you want me to know right now, Jesus? What do you want me to know? How do you see me right now? What do you see going on inside of me? And then I hear Paul's words, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far awaits them all. So fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So we're just going to do a little exercise. I know our time is coming, but this is just a little exercise. And so will you humor me just for a little bit this morning? Just for a little bit. Okay. So think about what you're facing. What is the difficult thing that's making life challenging? Maybe it isn't particularly difficult right now for you. So if that's the case, consider a problem that you're working to resolve as we go through this exercise. So let's take a moment of quiet. Holy Spirit, we just say right now, come. Come and help us see things that we are facing as they really are. Help us to see what is taking place in our story. Remember that in any good story, there are four roles, and we can play them at any given time. So I just want to remind you of the four roles. The victim role. I cannot believe this is happening to me. I don't need this right now. How am I ever going to get through this? It's too much. It feels like I can't get ahead. I feel like I'm going backwards. When I feel this level of doom or lack of control, often I feel like I find myself saying, I need someone to come in and I want someone to save the day. Where is my knight in shining armor? I might hide or might vo avoid reality, the victim. The villain, an inability or resistance to look at myself. I'm outward focused. If they wouldn't have done this, I would not be here in this mess or in this pain. The whole situation is their fault, and this is where there's a tendency to go into enemy mode. When I do that, I want to make the other person small or even crush them so that I feel better. Then there's the hero. Facing reality, accepting what is true, rises to the challenge and allows it to change them, grow them up, and transform how they see their story. Then there's the guide, and this is where I engage with the one who's accepting reality and accepting the challenge before them, the hero, and I come alongside to encourage. So as you think about your story, what roles have you played? What roles are you playing? So I want to give you a recent example of finding myself in all of these roles. And I just want, I'm sharing this with you because I want you to know I struggle just like you. No pastor is ever immune from the realities of the struggles of the world that we live in and of our own brokenness, okay? I lay down my reputation because I don't do any of this without him. I do not have it all figured out. So my mother-in-law went into the hospital as unresponsive on May 17th. They discovered the sepsis and they started treatment, but the doctor said she's in rough waters. And so that's just like a to your heart. It's very concerning. And so then, you know, I'm thinking about that and my family. And then I'm thinking, okay, well, in a couple, like, days, like a week, looming ahead is this pastor's conference I'm supposed to go to in Windsor, May 25, May 23 to 25. The flights, the hotels, the tickets are all purchased. 
And then I have another conference, June 4th to the 11th. Again, everything's purchased. No one knows how this is going to progress. Will Mary improve? Will she get worse? What's going to happen? And I know the right answer, right? Family comes first. But there are lots of things that go on inside of us. Lots of things that impact us. So the victim response starts to rise. Oh no, how was I ever supposed to know this was going to happen? I should have never purchased the tickets to go. I should have never purchased the tickets. Think of all the money that's going to be lost. I feel bad. What can I do about this? Panic sets in. There's this focus on self. And then the villain role. Because of my own fear, discomfort, selfishness, Earlier in that week, I'd responded to my husband, Ron, very negatively about his own health struggles, and I said some crushing things. It was not good, and I made him feel very small in that moment, which I later apologized for, but it was not okay, and it had an impact on our relationship as we're walking through this stress. The hero role. So I began to face reality, accepting that I have no control and needing to trust and walk this out to whatever end and accept what happens. And what I'm learning in these moments of struggle is that the habits I've formed over years stick despite the pain. So again, this can be good habits or bad habits, but I've put some good habits in place. So I continue to get up early at 5.30 or 6 a.m., I have my quiet time with the Lord, and this rhythm helps me to be still and more present in what's happening. It's been a journey to learn to sit in the uncomfortable and not having an answer and not having a solution, recognizing that he knows every struggle inside of me, and he's waiting for me to say, Jesus, come, come and sit with me. Come and sit with me in my unknowing. And this is what I found myself saying. Lord, you are the good shepherd. You know where you want me. I'm going to wait on you and trust that you will provide what's needed for whatever happens. I let go. And I put it into your hands. I'm not going to fret or panic or try to strive or control the situation because I know that's only going to steal my energy from being able to do what I need to do and to be able to be present. So I continued to exercise, eat well, where I could give of myself, my time, my talent, my treasure. So often we are dealing with something, when we deal with something difficult and painful, we find that we pull back, right? We self-protect, and sometimes that might be needed, but I recognized that by continuing to keep up the good rhythms that I already had, I was able to keep at peace inside, which helped me to be more present and to be clear-minded. I know he's with me. He loves me despite my struggles. And he is going to help me get through this. And I have to say I surprised myself. When I didn't know what to do, when I just was at a loss, I had the rhythms in my life to lean into because they were just normal. Like my brain had that path, just do this. And they helped me to turn to Jesus and be present to him, help me to trust. And I could keep going and actually be present to the needs around me. So having a rhythm, a structure to help me stay focused on Jesus and my mental and emotional and physical health was so important. Storms will come, and it's not maybe, It's when. What do you have in place? I had even, you know what, I even had an inner healing session on May 21st before everything turned and we knew that they were taking Mary off of life support, like off of the treatment because I knew that what I was going into, I was going to need further support and I was going to need further help. I wasn't going to be able to do this all myself and so I went into a session and did some inner healing and I really, it was, it was really important. And then the guide role, as I chose to be present with the help I'd received from the Lord and from the things that I'd chosen to have in my life, 
I was able to step into the guide role and walk alongside my husband and encourage him towards his own hero role over a victim or villain as he faced his own mother's death. And I was so proud of him for doing his mom's eulogy at her funeral, even though it was so hard. And we did it together, but he wrote most of it. And he got to give that tribute to his mom. And I just thank the Lord that he was present with us in it all, because I couldn't have done it without the journey of walking with him. Heather, do you want to come up? And So some of you are like, well, what happened? <laughs> with the story. So the conference I was supposed to go to, the director the over, that was overseeing it, like when I let him know what was going on, like his words were so kind, and he's such a father at heart that he just made me cry. But he just was just so loving in his response to me. And something that ended up being a gift was that because of the conference dates that they were, they were the 23rd to the 25th, my schedule was clear. So this allowed me to focus on being with my husband and my family. I didn't have to worry about canceling or rescheduling meetings or appointments, and I was fully able to experience what it was like to journey with a family who was losing a loved one and just walking right to the end of life. I'd never done that before, and it was such a gift. And there were so many gifts in the whole process because I chose to be present, turning to wonder, trusting that God was in it, asking God, what are you, what are you up to? What do you want me to know? And then listening. And with Mary's passing, when she did on, on the Thursday, May 23rd, and it was her, her favorite time of the day was 7 a.m., and that's when she gave her last breath. It was at 7 a.m. and went to be with Jesus. And with her passing, I was able to refund my flights because it's for her death. You can get your flights refunded. So the money that I was all worried about, it's all taken care of. Like, he was in the details, like every detail. And I guess he wants me to go to the conference in June because now I'm able to go. So the good shepherd knew what I did not know. And as I leaned on him, he led the way. He made a way where I did not see any possible way. And though the outcome seems good, it's not what I would have ever have chosen. <laughs> I would have never chosen this. It was a hard week, and at times overwhelming and just exhausting. And life at times can feel like it can suck every ounce of joy out of us if we let it. And the older I get, the more I realize I have a choice. I have played the victim role pretty well in my life. And I really don't want to do that anymore. And for that to change, it's meant asking for help. I cannot do this alone. It has meant doing the hard work of inner healing, of counseling, facing my reality in community, and allowing others to speak into my life, taking responsibility for the consequences and impact of my actions, and learning what's getting in the way from my past and impacting my present. So I'm here to say this morning, I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but keep going. Don't give up. The hard work, the journey through the pain and the struggle is worth it. And you are in the middle of your story. Can you guys say that with me? I am in the middle of my story. Let's do that again. I am in the middle of my story. We are not done. It is not over. There is so much more. There is so much more for you. And it might look dismal at the moment, but God is not done. And so today, will you trust that God has a higher purpose? Will you allow the Holy Spirit the opportunity to help you understand and endure what you're walking through? Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. 
Will you trust him? His purposes for you. Or will you try to take your own struggles and pain into your hands and expend all that energy and miss the thing that he is doing to bring healing, life, and transformation? What will you choose? And this morning, I just really felt the Lord want me to encourage you. Lay your reputation down. It's not about you. It's not even what others think of you. It's about what he thinks of you. Let God refine and redefine who you are. He knows what you need. And so this this morning, the call is to surrender and just give it to him. And I feel like the Lord wanted me just to encourage you this morning that for some of you, there's another step. There's something that he's been speaking to you, something that he's encouraging you to do, and you've been resistant, or you've been uncertain, maybe a little bit fearful, but he wants you to lay down that reputation, lay down that pride, because he's got more for you. And expending the energy to try to figure it out yourself is not going to get you where you really want to go deep inside. And so I just want to remind us in this moment that there are amazing resources. Like I mentioned, I did inner healing just the couple days before my mother-in-law passed away. So we offer Sozo here, inner healing. You can reach out to the office and you can make an appointment and you can do some deeper work for your inner world. We have Celebrate Recovery, which is for your that's for your pain. It's for your suffering. It's for the things that are difficult in your life. It's not, a lot of people think it's just for addictions. No, it's for your hurts and your hang-ups and your habits, the things that are keeping you from the Father. And it's working and walking with those who've been through similar things, sharing your stories, which are powerful, to help you move in the direction that God has for you. Every Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, celebrate recovery here. Last week, we heard from Hank, the Integrated Health Transformation Center, IHTC, have amazing resources for you to dig in and get some counseling and some support for the journey that you're on because you're not alone. We have Alpha every Monday now starting at 6 o'clock. Jesus loves you, and that, and that course will remind you of his deep love for you and go deeper into what and who God is for us. So if you're, if you're newer to the journey or if it's just been like, you know what, I just feel like I don't know enough about God, Alpha. We've got connect groups. There's a, there's a number of them. And I wish we had more because we all need to be in some sort of small community to walk this out. We cannot do this alone. So if you're not in a connect group and you're curious, reach out to the office about that or come and see me. And the other thing I just want to encourage us with, and this was encouraged with me this week, um, you know, we come together in, you know, a church on a Sunday, and we feel his presence, and we know his presence. But he wants you to know his presence every day. And he wants us to go to that quiet place with him, that secret place with him every day. And if that's not part of your rhythm, I just want to encourage you to just carve out. It doesn't have to be long, you guys. It can be five or ten minutes to get you started. It will grow. But there are great resources to help you pray. The Lectio 365 app is a wonderful app to help you pray in the morning and at night. The Bible Recap will help you get started on a Bible reading plan. The resources are there. So I just want to encourage you, whatever resistance is there, let the Father come in and push down or take down those walls because You're in the middle of your story, and there's so much more for you, so much more for you. So let's just stand together, and I just want to pray over us. Um, And if there's anyone here that before we go, that you just, you've come this morning and you want prayer, you want not to leave this house without prayer, we will have some people to pray for you after. Um, and, if, and if you even want me to, you know, you just feel like, okay, like the Lord has been doing something in Tracy and I want her to pray for me, I can pray for you as well um, if you want individual prayer. But before we go, 
I just want to encourage you. There's a step that the Lord is asking you to take. Today is the day. You are not an island unto yourself, though you live on an island. <laughs> you are a child who is part of a family. And we are to walk together as kids in the family of God. So whatever that step is, God, I'm just going to pray. God, I pray this morning that whatever that step is that you're laying on individuals' hearts in this room, God, I pray that you would give them the boldness, the courage, and the strength, Lord, to take that step. That you would remind them, God, that this journey is better with you. <laughs> it's hard on this earth, but it's better when we walk with you because you've gone ahead. You are the good shepherd. You are the one that has prepared the path and prepared the way. And you are so close. You are so close to us in what seems sometimes as the darkest hour. You have said, do not fear. I am with you. So whatever it is he's asking you to just take a step into, whatever he's asking you to lay down, he is saying, do not be afraid. I am with you. I am with you. And I will help you take the step you need to take. And so, Father, right now, I just pray that you would just burn off, God, burn off anything, God, that a of you that is getting in the way of knowing you. And I pray that you would just fill each one up afresh and, a, and full of your life-giving presence today. Lord, we don't want to leave this place the same. We want to leave it with a newfound understanding, a newfound oomph <laughs> to step into those things that you have for us. So bless each one, I pray. God, I just, I thank you that you turn your face towards us, God. You look upon us with such delight. And Lord, as you look upon us, you give us peace. So I pray for peace on one. In Jesus' name, amen.